Since the study of the biology of aquarium fish began, interest has focused increasingly on reproduction. In reproductive biology, we encounter a diversity of forms and processes. A few species even belong to the group of so-called pseudo-mammals. Their method of caring for their offspring leads us to conjecture that they've reached a special stage of development. They allow us to make remarkable observations regarding the care and feeding of the swimming larvae. The discus fish of the genus Symphizodon, native to South America, is widespread as an aquarium fish. In many ways, the breeding of this fish is especially interesting. Therefore, it's studied often. As the first discus fish were introduced in the 1920s, it was still believed this fish was uncomplicated in its reproductive biology. Similar to the angle fish, it soon could be bred without difficulty. However, only in the beginning of the 1930s was it first bred successfully in the United States. It became evident the discus was a special fish, possibly shrouded in many mysteries. Complicated and lengthy import routes allowed only few of these fish to be imported. But true discus fever, which is still in progress to this day, first broke out approximately 20 years later. In the 50s, imports became more frequent. Breeding the fish successfully in captivity allowed for more and more insight into the interesting reproductive biology of the discus fish. Meanwhile, many aquarists in Europe made a name for themselves with their study of the care and breeding of these fish. One of the 50s pioneers was Dr. Edward Schmidt Folke, who was not only able to report successful breeds, but also made discus history, particularly in the 1960s, with breeds still being cared for and bred today. Many of the secrets of keeping and breeding the discus were revealed during that time. But even today, there are still many mysteries about these fish. The discus is still one of the special fish in the field of aquaristics in respect to its care and reproduction. But why? Specimens caught in the wild and those bred in captivity have to be differentiated. Experienced discus keepers distinguish between them by the growth and the form of their tail fins, for example. Fish bred in captivity display a straightly grown tail fin with clean contours, while the fin rays of the fish caught in the wild are not so exactly and straightly grown. The care of both types is comparatively unproblematic when certain rules are observed. It's important that the fish are kept in roomy aquariums with a minimum height of 40 centimeters and a capacity of at least 200 liters. The water values are generally of secondary importance when a few important rules are followed. The pH value, that is the hydrogen ion concentration, should, when at all possible, lie between 6.0 and 7.0. And the level of nitrogen, the nitrite and nitrate values, should be kept as low as possible. This means that a very good water quality is an essential requirement for optimal care of the fish. To meet this requirement, a filter as well as regular partial water changes are important. Large amounts of fresh water do not appear to be of such great importance. It's essential fish are kept in healthy, bacteriologically well-cleansed aquarium water with small amounts of fresh water frequently added. Temperature of the water should be kept at approximately 29 degrees Celsius and may briefly fluctuate two or three degrees. When discus are put together with other fish, if at all, it's important the others have similar care requirements and are peaceable and healthy. Several species of fish carry pathogenic agents they're immune to themselves but are harmful to the discus. A further decisive point is a diet which is as varied as possible. All types of food imaginable should be offered to the discus, whereby high quality frozen food should only be given after being defrosted and rinsed thoroughly when at all possible. But be careful. 
discus fish have difficulties with large pieces of food. When possible, the fish should be fed smaller quantities of food three or four times a day. Aside from that, the place where the aquarium stands should be quiet. Stress and confusion are poison for discus fish. When these points are followed, discus fish will be contented and will reward their keeper with vivacity and beauty. On the other hand, flaws in care will become visible immediately. No other aquarium fish will show you so quickly and unmistakably that it's not getting the proper care. And breeding, in this case, there are quite considerable differences between fish caught in the wild and those bred in captivity. While the various types of discus caught in the wild generally only breed under certain conditions equivalent to their native habitats, fish bred in captivity are much more tolerant regarding the conditions necessary for reproduction. More than 90% of the discus fish cared for today worldwide have been bred in captivity. This shows how much progress has been made in the study of reproductive biology. In the 50s and 60s, above all, the USA and Germany held the lead in discus breeding. But today, the focus has clearly shifted. Breeders in Asia, in particular, have shown often they also have the right touch. Today, you can say that a majority of all discus fish are bred in Asia. Not surprisingly, considering the imagination of the Asian peoples, some have interesting and unusual color variations. And the quality of these fish is always improving. This is a reason discus fish from Asia are known and sought after worldwide. And European breeders, for the most part, they concentrate on retaining the old standards. They care for and breed the wild color variations. Many new color varieties caught in the wild are studied by breeders and provide new data. The interest in keeping and breeding this special fish prompted discus lovers to organize into a breeders' association, initiated by Manfred Fahl. The basic idea for establishing the Discus Breeders Association was to tear apart the existing prejudices about caring for and keeping discus fish. For this purpose, the Discus Breeders Association was established on April 19, 1986. At the first meeting, 18 breeders were present. In the meantime, the number of participants has grown to over 120. Not only German breeders participate, but also breeders from many neighboring European countries. This Breeders' Association holds regular meetings every spring and fall to provide the chance to exchange ideas and experiences. At these meetings, the problems connected with keeping and breeding the discus fish are discussed. In order to expose the discus to a larger public, we also try to hold discus exhibitions at regular intervals. The connecting link of the Breeders' Association is a newsletter with information about all facets of discus fish keeping. Pamphlets also give advice for optimal care and breeding. But also other sources appear at regular intervals providing a variety of information about the discus fish, which is often called the king of the Amazon. Even though the care of these fish in the appropriate aquariums is no longer difficult, breeding is still sometimes problematic. It's true that many discus breeders are sometimes driven nearly to the verge of despair. But why? Here as well, you have to differentiate between animals caught in the wild and those bred in captivity. 
Fish caught in the wild are sensitive to many things, such as condition of the water, size of tank, choice of sexual partner, food, light, decorational materials, and last but not least, the seasons. By contrast, many fish bred in captivity, often for generations, are much more tolerant and reproduce with much less difficulty. But often other difficulties arise which are seldom problems with fish caught in the wild. The fundamental question arises, is the breeding of the discus fish more difficult than breeding other species of aquarium fish? This must be answered with a definite no. But why? Aside from the tank and the breeding fish, the most important factor for breeding the discus successfully is without question, the water. Aside from the fact that the water should be low in minerals, it should also be lightly acidic, which means that depending on the species or breeding form, the pH value should range between 5.5 and 6.2. Often lightly sinking conductivity and pH values act as a trigger or rather stimulate the willingness of the fish to spawn. Another important requirement for the healthy development of the eggs is healthy bacteriologically well conditioned water that is not all too fresh. It must be low on germs and maintained with an adequately sized and conditioned filter. The normal development of the eggs can only occur when the females, due to good care and a varied diet, are healthy and able to lay healthy eggs, which are then fertilized by the healthy sperm of the males. Especially when the fish spawn at too short intervals, the eggs will often die off after only a few hours. Despite prior fertilization, the eggs dissolve and later flow out of the egg membrane. This is why spawning at short intervals should be avoided. A period of about four weeks is advisable. This usually guarantees a healthy spawn that will develop well. Dying eggs, which have not yet been infected by fungus, will look like white eggs after a short time. They should not be mistaken for curdled or rather coagulated eggs, which are already dead when laid by the female and therefore white. These coagulated eggs do not harm the remaining healthy eggs with fungus infection as is often suspected. Their outer embryonic sac is smooth. Compared to the eggs infected with fungus, they show no trace of fungus mycelium. Fungal infection of the dead eggs usually first begins after a period of 48 to 55 hours. If bad quality water, rich in bacteria, does not accelerate this process. There are several reasons for the death of healthy fertilized eggs. Aside from the inviolable condition of the eggs that were laid, the composition of the water plays an important role. If the water in which the reproduction is to take place is too rich in minerals, too hard, or the pH value is too low or too high, the eggs will usually die. Between the egg membrane and the yolk sac with its embryonic blastoderm and blastodisc, there is a thin hollow cavity. 